and just say that there are people who maybe it's religion, maybe it's children and grandchildren like you you have, maybe it's something else. And they say, honestly, any tiny bit of inchworming beyond present hominidness is too much of a risk for our species. We should look for a billion year future of man as he is or as she is. Uh, we ought not alter that because we know what has happened to lesser species historically. Giving up that mantle, even by a millimeter, is far too much, and we ought not even be open to those futures that Mr. Bengio just said that maybe in the long term he would be open to. What might you say to that crowd? Well, I think we have to have an open mind. It's just like what philosophy teaches and science teaches, that first of all, we need to open our mind and our heart to other living beings intelligent or you know less intelligent that exists right now and once you do that first of all you might want to be vegetarian second uh you you might have some more respect for the possibility that other intelligent beings could arise and um we just need to be like doing i, I think we we do need to protect humanity we do need to try to remain safe but we also need to consider the possibilities that that exist and it's okay if it takes time it's we need to take the time that it, we need for understanding and taking the right decisions but humans are not the end all uh, we are part of a you know bigger um story that that is unfolding and even currently there are i think lots of beauty in other species that that we you know we don't know what it is to feel like a bat uh, for example or a dolphin, uh, or a dolphin. Yeah. and and so i think we need to have respect for that This is Daniel Figelli. You're listening to episode one of the Trajectory interview series where we're focusing on destinations, possible future combinations of man and machine intelligence, and where we should be going. Our first guest is none other than Yashua Bengio, Turing Award winner and scientific director of the famed Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Yashua's recent change of heart around AI risk and the potential for artificial general intelligence is a big part of why this topic is on a global stage now and is acceptable in common parlance, things like AI extinction risk, at places like the United Nations. I spoke with Yashua first eight or nine long years ago when AI risk was the furthest thing from his mind. I still have his survey responses. We were talking about AI risks in a 20-year time horizon, and this was 10 years ago, mind you. Um, and he mentioned something about sort of employment considerations, but really thought of the bigger picture AI risks, uh, whether it's extinction or AGI, as literally not even worth thinking about. As you'll see in this episode, his mind has changed pretty drastically, and he's remarkably frank about what got his mind to change. He's also very much not in the camp of preventing AI progress, as you'll see in this episode. He's interested in the blooming of post-human intelligence, but also getting it right. I learned a lot in this episode. It was an absolute pleasure to jump back in with Yashua after nine years of not having any conversations outside of Facebook comments uh, and to be able to really unpack his ideas in a big way. I hope you'll benefit from some of his policy thoughts, and I'm grateful as heck to have him as guest number one in the Trajectory series. Without further ado, Yashua Bengio here in episode one of the Trajectory. Dr. Yashua Bengio, welcome to the show. Good to chat with you again. Thanks for discussing with me. Yeah. It's uh, it's been quite some time since our lengthy conversation. Uh, I think it was it was actually eight and a half years ago or something like that. Yashua, I looked it up. Uh, you know, the Turing Award has happened since then. All the innovations around attention have happened since then. So much progress has happened in this space, and we're going to get into the real meat and potatoes of where we're headed with AI. You've been speaking a good deal about policy. We're going to pull things up, but I want to talk first about what made the aha happen for you? I know it related to chat GPT. The way it comes around in my mind is this. You folks were so close to the science that may, you guys made discoveries that made all of this happen. At the same time, we go back 10 years, there were people saying some of the things you're saying now. Maybe AI will have its own sense of self-preservation. Maybe it will engage in cyber attacks and biological warfare, and those might be serious risks. Um, 
and that was some of those conversations were older. What made it easier to progress in the science than in terms of seeing some of those considerations back then? Well, I I just made a blog post which goes into some of this, but let me um, explain a bit of that trajectory. Um, first, I I should have seen this coming earlier. Hmm. And um, one of the things I've been writing about is why is it that I and others uh, somehow looked the other way for many years? Well, one excuse, I think, which is uh, the main reason why uh, at least I didn't pay too much attention to those risks is that it, it felt so far away into the, in the future. Yeah. Like I've been convinced for many, many years, if not decades, that the brain is a machine. It's a biological machine. So there's no reason why you know we couldn't, in the future, build machines that are as smart as us. And then once we understand that, probably smarter than us. Yeah. But the things we were building, they were so stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you and, were and in really this like the, decades the scaling, ago, right? No, so the, this this yeah. scaling thing isn't something we could do very much in academia. No. So the the kind of models my student and I have been developing until recently, like, they, we couldn't see how they could be harmful, and in fact, a lot of my colleagues continue to think of it like this. But yeah. but with Chat GPT, it became clear to me that the horizon of when we could reach human level AI could be much closer. And not only that, another reason why I, you know, revise my estimate is that I've been working since 2016, 2017 on how we bring something like reasoning into deep learning. Actually, the attention work from 2014 was the first step in that direction. Because attention is one of the key ingredients of our kind of conscious processing. But I, I've been working, especially in the last two years, on new mathematical models for for deep learning which if if they pan out could really um change the game and deal with pretty much all of the issues we currently see with chat gpt when chat gpt came out in november last year my first immediate reaction was oh look there are all these problems that i've been talking about for many years um you know overconfidently wrong uh you know confabulation and um out of distribution generalization that was not as good as humans and, and many other things that people have pointed out. Uh, difficulty when the system has to reason through many steps. Uh, difficulty with doing math, for example. So I tried these things myself. In the first few months, I just played with it and tried to like nail the mistakes that it made. So I just focused on that. But eventually it dawned on me like, you know, it takes a lot of hard work to make it fail. And the rest of the time, it's actually talking to me with pretty good English. And even French, which I found really amazing, because yeah, I'm, 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 you know, that's my mother tongue. Of course. And and so gradually, I I came to accept that. Well, gee, we pretty much nailed language. So like, that's the Turing test. Now, you know, people disagree, and you know, yes, you can find failures, and an expert will be able to like find the questions that make it fail. But for ninety percent of people. Uh, they would be fooled, except if they ask ChatGPT if it is a machine or a human, because it's not been trained for that. But it would be easy to design a version that would be kind of trying to pass for human. Yes. So, so that's already scary in itself. So I started thinking, oh, gee, we're entering a new era where misinformation could be scaled up. So it started with this, and I started talking to other people about this and. Uh, you know, I, I'm in touch with uh, folks at the Canadian government, and you know, there are people starting to talk about legislation. Uh, and and I, I've I, I was involved with the Global Partnership on AI, which is an international mm -hmm. organization uh, thinking about uh, things like responsible AI. And so, I I started really going deeper into this, and. Um, and then thinking, but okay, so misinformation is one thing, but what if, what if um, we actually, you know, go beyond uh, mastery of language and we get things that can manipulate people better than people? 
uh, what if we can get um, systems that can understand science better than people? And the, the reason why I was thinking about science is because for the last three years, because of the pandemic, I've been working on AI for science. Like, how do we use AI to design better um, antivirals, for example, or sure. uh, you know, new drugs in general? And and you know, there were this there was this paper showing you can fairly trivially change the AI training uh, and querying system so that instead of designing uh, a cure, it would design a, a chemical weapon. Right. Yeah. So, so all of these things have made their way into my mind, and um, and I realized that regulation takes a lot of time. Um, it, it, you know, look at how much time we we you know we've had with climate change, and and you know decades, and we still haven't fixed it, even though we know how to fix it. Yeah. So so yeah, I started getting worried about this and thinking that governments need to better understand the, the risks that are coming because of misuse um, and potentially more. Something that I'm not, like now I have read a lot of uh, AI safety and so on, but but before I didn't know much. I, I read um, I read um, uh, Stuart Russell's 2019 book uh, yep. called Human Compatible and yep, it was yeah. a really great lesson to understand some of the issues. But even though I understood at a uh, sort of intellectual level, yeah. this alignment problem. Emotionally, I still like I didn't. Yeah, I I didn't change my trajectory. It didn't, I didn't seem like it clicked like, for you. Yeah. No. Yeah, and and it's just this chat GPT basically on this trajectory during the winter that made me realize that I should really be coherent. I'm with you, and I I guess I I wonder your take on this because you're sort of hinting at it a little bit. Um, we we had uh, uh, Stuart on as basically right when that book was was published on a, an earlier AI future series. You said the word trajectory a lot. Oddly enough, that's the name of this new entire media branch that we're doing specifically around the big picture of AI. So I like that word a lot. Um, but yes, I wasn't seeing you in the dialogue then. You know, there's even going back b before I think Stuart was making a lot of noise about this, the Omohundros of the world and yes. and Yosha, Yosha Bach and certainly Gertzel and people have opinions about Gertzel. I have a lot of respect for the man myself. Um, who were sort of talking about this grander explosion of intelligence, I almost wonder if you were banging away up in the frozen north for decades, moving inches in this core science, seeing it from the very ground up, and, and as you had said, building stupid things, you know, that were important and hopefully moving forward science, but the survey response from way back in eight years ago about, uh, you know, what do you consider to be the most likely AI risk in the next hundred years? I phrased it as hundred years was too far off for me to say something meaningful. And that, and I think yeah, that it is- That's what I would have said. It's incredibly admirable that you've pivoted your position. I think many smart people do not, but you very clearly do. And you've been very open about that. And I could, I think you're singular in terms of how quickly and how openly you've done that. Well, but do it's, you, yeah, go ahead. It's hard. It's hard to admit you've, you were wrong. Uh, it's hard to totally admit that uh, the work you've done, your identity, um, your beliefs, for example, my beliefs about open source, my beliefs about yeah. open science, my belief, I like, I didn't really pay too much attention about dual use issues because, well, I was not into like nuclear physics or something. Yeah. But of course, now I do. And I think that, you know, we have cognitive biases that prevent us from being fully rational, that make us look the other way, that make us focus on things that are maybe give us comfort and don't require us to change our views. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. So it's it's maybe in your perspective, it's, it's less of seeing inchworm progress for the decades, but it's also, well, maybe it's partially that, but it's also just the challenge of having to come to grips with this. Um, but yes. you did, and now we're having this conversation. You've had many others, um, and I'm excited to unpack it. So now we'll get into the meat and potatoes. I, ex I appreciate right. understanding your mental journey. Um, I think about the sort of AI game in terms of the big picture. The big picture being, you know, there was once amoebas, now there's people. What's going on from here, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think I think that's the only game in town. That's my 
personal opinion, I think it's the only game in town. And I think that the answers to those questions are very big. And when you talk to people about near-term policy, it's almost like you drop them in a maze and you say, okay, do you want to go left or right? And right. Maybe that's fine. But I, I think ultimately people have values decisions that they've made within their own heart or they have an inclination that brings them somewhere. And everything they do is going to move them in that direction. I shared with you before we recorded the basic idea of this kind of uh, intelligence trajectory political matrix mm -hmm. idea where we have um, pr preservation of just pure humanity, some level of maybe cognitive upgrading and strong AI that serves humanity, and then really a pretty significant trajectory beyond people in terms of ascension. And then on the other strata, we've got total laissez-faire international approach, a kind of collaborative approach like we have now, the United Nations, things like that, and then maybe a more controlled approach where we really do have to batten down the hatches. When you think about what your heart calls for and sort of where you'd like us to move towards what your intuition is, a better future, where do you land there? Well, there's the heart and there's the kind of reason. Oh, do do them both. Do them both. Right. So I, I've been such a strong proponent of openness for many, for all my professional life. It's been one of the hardest things for me to accept that AI could be dangerous, could be dual use, just like any other powerful technology, yeah. but maybe more if it gets more powerful. Certainly. And so I've moved on the on the sort of control versus openness, at, you know, towards the middle, let's say. Um, yeah. um, on the um, axis of preservation versus ascension, I'm a bit conservative in the sense that uh, there's too much unknown uh, about you know, you know what what kind of intelligence future let's say AI AI entities would create. I, I really don't have any idea, and I think I have too much. I care too much about humanity to just forget that feeling. So I, I want clearly to preserve humanity, but I, I do think that technology can help us um, have better lives, but it can't be at the expense of losing humanity. So I guess I'm in the middle there as well. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate, I can tell you, you've wrestled with these things and I'm, I'm kind of, I'm stoking the flames of, I'm stoking embers that you've very recently been burning, you know, in terms of these logs. Um, when it comes to the preservation of humanity, I think there's some folks who say, hey, no matter what, I don't care if it's my great, 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 great grandchildren's future, humanity should not uh, vastly augment ourselves and hand over the baton uh, of power to something more capable than ourselves. That is just not something that should literally ever occur. There's other people who say, hey, Right now, we should not blast off with an AGI that we don't understand. But over the course of decades, maybe centuries, if cognitive enhancement happens and we understand intelligence a little bit deeper and then something greater is birthed uh, that goes even farther, maybe there could be a trajectory of intelligence as there was before you and I, Yashua, right? There, were, there was rodentia with sure. you know that, that little postage stamp of, of cortex uh, now there's you and I, certainly you with uh, much more than a postage stamp of cortex. Um, and we might presume that there are post-cortex uh, uh, sure. substrates that could house much grander things. Are you um, in that forever camp in terms of hominids as they are, or are you more in the let's be conservative for now camp? I, I think we need to understand better be before we move forward. Okay. And I do think that humanity could gain some sort of augmentation. It doesn't have to be biological. I mean, we're already doing it with technology. Um, I mean, humans, we have many reasons to uh, deplore a lot of human behavior. Yeah. And it's interesting to ask how we can kind of get uh, to fix some of these problems. I mean, so I, you know, I've been in the camp for a long time, and still think that education is a huge tool in in making humans better. Uh, bringing the uh, kind of material well and psychological well-being 
uh, at, at the top that humanity can enjoy for everyone. I mean, I would start with that, right? How far we can get with that? Um, and who knows? I think technology could help us be better in many ways, but I think we do have to be prudent because we have so much at stake here. I'm I'm completely with you, and I think we do have a lot at stake. I guess if I'm putting this correctly for you, it's, hey, who knows exactly what the grand trajectory of intelligence is, but for the time being, let's not just blow through all the hurdles and just reach into... No. We, because oddly enough, oddly I know, enough, I know some people who are there like now. That. There now is a camp there. Yeah, and you know, yeah, it's, ten it's, years it's, ago, it's a very small camp. It, it's it's small today, although I suspect it won't be small forever. Ten, fifteen years ago, there were actually very few of those people. There were a lot of people interested in making measured progress and eventually leading to a grand post-human trajectory, which I right. I still think can be quite a noble vision. But there's now a subset today that are all about. Um, as soon as possible, no matter how little we understand about it, no matter what the immediate risks are, just pedal to the metal. And I think that that's a you know that's a that's a position that that some people now hold. They want to rush directly so, to ascension. So here here's a, an emotional response about this. Yes. Um, I have children. I have a grandchild. Yeah. I. I think of all the beauty that exists in the world in the eyes and the hearts of humans. I don't want to risk that. Now, it you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't work to improve the condition of humans and improve the kind of intelligence of what we do, or you know, maybe our descendants. But but I think there's so, you know, we have eight billion beautiful human beings out there, and we should not play lightly with that. I'm I'm with you. I think that complete willy-nilly roll the dice. Is 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 a wild position to hold, but at the same time, I've I've heard strong arguments um, where people have said, I think when people do have children and grandchildren, I think there is a more natural inclination away from progression and certainly ascension and closer to preservation. Um, I can't say that that biological gut instinct is necessarily the sparklingly brilliant moral compass, because I think Yashua, we could probably agree that biological impulses may or may not be the the grand sparkling moral compass that we would want to make all decisions by, but it's understandable. Yeah. I have also seen people with sparkles in their eyes make the following argument. Why at some point there was something vastly below rodentia that could uh, experience no higher bliss than uh, eating a tree root or mating for half a second. Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 that, that was sort of the totality of sort of sentient upside. And now you and I, we can enjoy having this intellectual discussion. You can go home and enjoy playing a game of chess. You can make scientific discoveries and enjoy it. Um, poetry, art, uh, myriad possibilities. The, the potential and capability of our form is such a panoply. It's not just more of what the rodent has. It's entirely new magazines of richly worthy sentient experience mm -hmm. and, and ability. And to cap the continual blooming of that, which, which hath bloometh since long before you and I were here, would be a travesty. Um, do you see any credence to that in the longer term, assuming we understand the technology, or would you argue against that standpoint? I would argue neither. I think that we need to understand better. Like I'm a scientist and um, I think also from a philosophical point of view, before acting, you need to understand. That's the whole point of science. Sure. Uh, so grasping it, grasping this stuff first, but I, I guess it, in terms of the idea, so certainly for today, you're like, Dan, I'm not going to put the pedal to the metal. Completely understood. But I guess what you're getting at is, I can see that those things might be worthy, but honestly, we don't understand this stuff well enough. We need to really look at it and, and understand it first. So you're, it sounds like open to the the fact that we are part of potentially a, a blooming trajectory that For happened sure. bef before you and I, but that we shouldn't just jump into that stream and, and make it go forward. Great. So now I think I understand where you sit on the map. I think the cool thing about that, Yashua, is when I see what you post on Facebook and drop comments and whatnot, I'll sort of know the direction that you're headed in, not just your individual decisions about individual things. And I think that's incredibly useful. 
Um, in terms of facilitating this conversation and getting to understanding, one of the other things I want to sort of talk about here is how we encourage people to have these tough conversations. Some of what's been fun about watching you turn on to the ideas of AI risk is sitting side by side with some of your friends in Montreal or even folks like Andrew Ng, who famously you know, equates AI risk to overpopulation on Mars, right? Even when Stuart Russell was very far down this train, Andrew was not. And Andrew seems like an incredibly kind and nice guy, but just you know, was kind of shooting down these ideas very willy nilly. You've had this ability to get people to at least intellectually engage, to make it less about pure right and wrong, who's going to call the other person dumb, um, and more about what is the common ground? What can we discover here? What should we understand here? What for you has been key in facilitating that? Well, I think um, in order to be a good scientist and also take good moral decisions, you have to recognize that you can be mistaken. And you have to recognize that there could be multiple standpoints that are equally consistent with logic and data. Sometimes maybe you fixate on one standpoint. This is the way usually human brains work. We tend to adopt an idea, a way to interpret the world. And when someone else has a different interpretation, we, we enter into an argument. That's very natural and human. But there is a, um, a way to think about this uh, mathematically, actually. This is the Bayesian posture, which says, if there are multiple ways to interpret the world, the, the, the data that we have about it, and they're all consistent with that data, and they are, you know, each is self-consistent. Then you, you shouldn't be picking just one of them. You should be somehow bringing all of these points of view into the decision you're going to take. So, in your uh, figure, you also had this authoritarian kind of uh, yes, role. Certainly, it is bad for that reason because um, there will be one person or a small group of people who will take decisions um, and they will tend to focus on one interpretation of how things you know uh, are yeah democracy is the opposite it's about checks and balances where okay we disagree we agree to disagree we respect each other and somehow we come to a consensus in action so let, what, what can we do that's um, not disastrous for anyone's uh, point of view, at least as little as possible, right? And I think this is how we should handle these debates, these disagreements. Well, first we need to recognize there are strong emotions. So earlier in our discussion, we yeah. talked about the emotional aspects that make us sometimes a bit blind to things or, uh, you know, difficult to change our mind. But but second, we need to recognize that there are m there are multiple scenarios that are all like plausible and different interpretations. And so long as the arguments stand logically and they are consistent with things we know, and you can't reject these arguments, then you have to embrace them. You have to embrace other people's views as well. And it's difficult. Um, but but that's a lot of how science works. It's a lot of how democracy works. So that's how I'd like to see those discussions go forward. That we accept to actually listen to the other's arguments and think them through, um, seeking truth rather than trying to be the one who's right. Yeah. And I, my, I'm going to tell you my gut instinct about why this has worked for you and see if you think this is right in terms of why you've been able to get people who haven't necessarily been putting this on the table and, and picking it apart in an open and, and rational way, kind of without emotion. There is the factor, which is somewhat obvious, that it's Yashua Bengio coming in and starting this conversation. So we have we have that. But let's let's leave that off the table for now. I see two things. I'd love to know if you would agree with this or disagree. Two things that have made other people open up and be really receptive to your level-headed, let's really talk about this way of thinking. One is that 
you've actually recently changed your mind. You have not sat in a camp and stuck it out in one way. And I hope that I and maybe the people listening have the courage to do exactly the same thing if the facts demand it. But you've done that yourself. Number two, I think you haven't come in to these conversations to people and said, you need to look at both sides of the fact. It has felt more like you've just communicated more offline and be like, let's actually just get together about this and just taken off the heat of, you know, you're not on Twitter, but you shouldn't be, Joshua. It's not a good place. I'm, I'll yeah, tell you right now. Know. It's not It's not a great place. I'm, I'm, you know, you're, you're better off for not being there. Um, but uh, you've done the opposite of what Twitter is, which is quick quips back and forth. And some of your, your peers who I think are wonderful people, you know, are, are certainly doing a bit of that. And you've more just kind of engaged one-to-one. So it's felt like you have the credibility of changing your own mind and the wherewithal to say, let's be respectful. I'll listen to you. Let's just sit down. Tell me if I'm wrong, but those from the outside have appeared to be your secret weapons. Well, I don't think it's secret. It's it's the way science should proceed. And I think that's the way politics should proceed, ideally. But it's it's difficult. You, you have to sometimes go against your um, gut reactions of trying to argue one way or the other. Um, but we have to, we have to take the time to sit down in person. Yes. Yeah. And, and listen and, um, also take the time to think through this. Like some of the, my realizations have taken time. Yep. I've moved and, and it, you, you need to, sometimes it takes time to digest complicated ideas. It's, it takes time to digest difficult emotions. It takes time to think through possibilities, a lot of walks in nature. That's my trick. That's, that's the other weapon. Um, I like it. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you need to take that time. And it, one problem is if you paint yourself too strongly as an advocate of one view, it's, it gets harder to then change because you, you, you know, you've painted yeah. yourself in a corner. Yeah. And ego is ego. And, it, it, you know, once you've committed publicly for one view, it's really hard to change. So we should try to avoid that. So you're saying we should, for scientists or people in the field, not to say, I carry the banner of uh, this political stance yeah. or this idea of the science, but say, yeah. this is my current perspective on. Yeah, or um, I, I currently view things this way. Yeah. Which which leaves you the room for changing your mind six months later. It, it absolutely does. And I, I have a I have a pretty rough feeling, and, and I don't know if you'll disagree, that a lot of the polarization that we're gonna see on that quadrant that you and I just talked about for a second, the loud versions of that dialogue, I'm sure there's much softer versions that are not like this. The loud versions are very much about locking into a square, right? Political positioning is about I'm all about openness and acceleration, and there is no time where anything other than those two things are the best. Pedal to the metal, let's go. And then there's yeah. other people who are in the um, anything that is intelligent in any way beyond humanity from now until the end of time is an absolute you know, uh, defiance of God or defiance of, of what's best for humanity, and we should not even be thinking about it. And I'm yeah. going to lock myself into some kind of authoritarian um, kind of control scenario of preservation. Uh, I I wonder if one of the ways to loosen that up is to encourage more of the the way of thinking that that you're exemplifying here, which is being able to move yourself. But I wonder if people can do that. Well, we can try. I mean, so a whole lot of philosophies to help us do that. But but I want to add another thing. Um, sometimes things are more complicated than what may transpire in uh, immediate like debates or arguments. So let me give an example that's a very difficult question that has been very difficult for me and, and, and uh, where there's a lot of opposition, for example, between my friend Jan Lecran and myself. It's the open yes. source question. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about that. And I want to use it to illustrate that sometimes it's like neither it's not like uh, one side is right and the other is wrong or vice versa. Course, it's something much more complicated. Course, yeah. So here's my current view on this question. And I, I, I'm happy to change my mind if I understand better in the future. I'm glad to hear that. I'm um, glad to hear that. So it's all about the level of danger of the technology. So 
if the technology that we can share, open source or you know whatever, maybe algorithms in the paper, uh, weights of uh, LLM, whatever it is that we share, if the technology can be dangerous, say in the wrong hands, there are different levels of danger. Like you know, a gun can be dangerous. A nuclear bomb is much more dangerous. So there are different levels of danger. And my current view is that if the thing we would like to potentially share, because like we all want to share, like I mean, scientists want to share, like we want others to know what we've yeah. been doing, and you know, we're proud of our work. For sure. We want like, others to build on what we've done. Um, but if if the technology we want to share is below a threshold, then the benefits of open source dominate. Like there are lots of benefits. It accelerates the progress. It builds up uh, a kind of immune system because if you if you share and there are some bad actors who use that, then there are you know lots of other people who also have access to that code and can help defend because the it's like cybersecurity, right? Uh, yep. Lots of people having access to the code, they can also find failures or fixes or, you know. So being open sometimes is a very good defense. Um, but if the technology is above that threshold of danger, then it's not clear anymore whether you should share and maybe you shouldn't. And, and to make that maybe um, more concrete, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, let's say that you're learning to swim, but you don't know yet. You're not very good yet. So you could you could go into a place where it's not dangerous because you you know go into a pool there's somebody by the pool if in case you're in trouble and yeah maybe you're gonna drink some water that's the worst thing that can happen um, and yeah you should jump in the water right you should take the risk because you're gonna be learning and get better just like if we share code um, that could be misused like current LLMs I think if they're shared it's actually beneficial. And yeah, maybe some people are going to be huh. some people are going to be misusing that, but we can probably defend and we'll defend better. So on that, I agree with Jan. But what I think is that there's a point, and I don't know where it is, which is part of the problem, where we shouldn't be sharing anymore, uh, where the the capacity is too large. So it's like like instead of jumping into the the, the nice pool with someone who can watch over you, you're you know dropped in the middle of the ocean uh, uh, in the middle of a big storm. That's yeah. not a good idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So there are risks that you don't want to take, even though, yes, you know, taking risks is uh, part of learning is taking risks. But, but sometimes the risks is too high and the, you would, you know, if you lose your life, your learning is useless. I, I am, I'm completely with you. I think the, the analogy sticks. And then I think there there are some there's a, a small band making the argument that um, no matter how big the storm, if if we can throw ourselves into it, the storm will blossom into something grand and drastic and take over the galaxy, and that'll be great. And and I'm not if against they the idea. If could prove that to me, I'll be happy. Uh, sure, 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 exactly. And and I think that's a bit of the challenge, right? We, if current LLMs scaled up to infinity, uh, we're not sure that's going to be a blossoming of pure pure goodness or, or even of continued power into the galaxy it sounds like again you're not a, you're not against the idea that eventually that's that might be where we go but certainly that right now we're in tremendous danger we've got to get a better grasp on this stuff um this takes us a little bit to some of what you'd mentioned in the senate so you put up a, a short blog post summarizing some of this and i thought it was worthwhile and something that we'll probably link to in the show notes um you talked about international governance structures that kind of go beyond current kind of voluntary opt-in things. You know, the OECD has their values, for example. I think you and I are both involved in the futures group yeah. with the OECD, been over there on the value side for the last four or five years. You know, important work, maybe not quite as strong as what you're talking about right now. You also talked about um, global research around governance and risk. And then you mentioned um, research and development specifically to counter kind of rogue yeah. AI and some of these bigger threats. There are some folks who would say, and indeed, have argued that the prevention of any of those risks would really require a degree of Orwellian control that would be almost unbearable because we're not talking about yeah, nuclear yeah. That's materials the, that's the, here, the, right? The, we're the, talking the about Nick the Nick Bostrom story. Yeah, and you've and you've um you've brought up some of the analogy to nukes and why it's not like nukes in the past. That's been part of discussions you've had before. 
Um, do you see this as something, this this opportunity to, uh, Toby Ord, also in that OECD group of ours, he talks about kind of, I think, the long pause or something like that, where humanity thinks about where do we ultimately want to go? In other words, what is the trajectory across the game board that we actually want to start moving across? Seems very similar to your take. Do you think that such a pause is viable in a collaborative international order versus a control one? Some people are, are happily saying it needs to be more control in order for us to be safe, but what is your perspective? Okay, so control is not a black and white thing. We have we Certainly. have a lot That's of control a in our current society. You know, we control how planes are built and who is allowed to drive them. Um, Absolutely. And we we can reconcile democracy and decentralization of power, which is really what democracy is about, with some level yep. of control to protect the public. And in a way, what I'm talking about is that kind of thing. I'm not talking about bringing an Great. authoritarian regime. In fact, I think it would be dangerous. So I don't trust authoritarian regimes to do the right thing for the people in, in terms of AI safety. There, there are two reasons for this. So one is the authoritarian regimes are too obsessed with their own survival. They, they don't want to be replaced by someone else. And yeah. so their priority is, is, is that rather than the well-being of the people, which is hopefully what politicians should be elected for. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, yeah, yeah. but we're closer oh, the, you know, to it. The, 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 Winston, the Winston Churchill quote, right? The Winston yes, exactly. Churchill quote. Um, uh, yeah. So that's one reason why authoritarian regimes are dangerous from the point of view of the survival of humanity. Yeah. If, we, if we get to the point where we have very powerful AI systems smarter than us and so on, it's the wrong regime to be in because it's not going to take the right decisions. It's going to be obsessed by its own survival. Also, it's going to take wrong decisions because of the it's not Bayesian thing. You know, it's going to adopt one interpretation of things, and it, it is not going to consult uh, and maybe have a wiser kind of decision making process. And because of that, it's going to make mistakes. And in fact, authoritarian regimes make mistakes, right? Yeah. And it's costly for their people. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for that. So, when the cost is maybe you know material development is one thing when the cost is the survival of humanity i think it's really something to avoid so i think we should design whatever we're going to be doing in terms of ai safety political coordination internationally and nationally we need to design it so that it is not going to lead to authoritarian regimes and of course authoritarian regimes can use ai to help stay in power, which is another component of the problem. I'm I'm completely with you there. And 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 by the way, bringing up this topic, I was in no way making the supposition that you were pro No, but I think it's important to regard. explain why it's a bad idea. Sh sure, sure. No, I, I'm I'm with you. And and I, I actually I'm completely on board with what you'd mentioned. I think there are absolutely reasons to suspect that it wouldn't be the best way to even get to safety. I guess that brings us to and there's probably a little bit of a way to to nutshell some of your thinking here. What, you know, um, democracy being a controlled sort of decentralization yes. of power, uh, it, it allows for dynamism um, and it also allows for some degree of safeguarding. And and this this has been pretty productive economically and otherwise, sciences, et cetera, et cetera. And so thank goodness you and I live in um, at least nominal democracies in some way, shape or form. Um, in order to make sure that these relatively, you've brought up in other interviews that you don't need a massive 17 warehouse, you know, uh, setup of pure GPUs in order to build something powerful. There's ways that things could be decentralized. Even weights could be, you know, scattered and spread in certain ways. Um, lots of open source tools, etc. What does it look like to buffer against some of those directions we don't want to go in right now that feel more like pure risk, that maybe an international order would decide we're, we're too risky. What are ways to buffer against that outside of looking at every one and every zero that goes into somebody's computer? Uh, I wish I had good answers. So we only have it's like democracy. We For now, I can only tell you like the the least bad of the solutions I can think yes, about. Yes, the least bad. Let's t let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So first, obviously, we need to accelerate regulation that, um, like for example, with licensing, 
that reduces the number of um, and the probability of bad actors getting their hands on dangerous stuff, dangerous code, dangerous models, dangerous knowledge. We have to like name things as they are. Um, and if you do a little bit of calculation, this is the most, this is the strongest effect of, uh, in terms of like reducing the probabilities of uh, something really bad happening, like a big misuse or a loss of control that's dangerous for humanity. Uh, reducing access is, is the strongest kind of, because you can make a, a, a calculation that shows that if the probability of a catastrophe is small, then if you reduce the number of people that have access by a factor like a thousand, you basically also reduce the probability of a catastrophe by a factor of a thousand. So it's very powerful. Now, if is, this is an extreme case where the probability of a catastrophe is small, but you know the, the calculation is more complicated than otherwise. But it's a very, in other words, it's like the, the first order of business is is get rid of everything is open source, and and make sure that the people who are allowed to do it, do it right. So that's the whole point of licensing, and it's you know used in many sectors of society, um, and have the right training. So you also want not the, just the organizations, but the people who do it. So think about airplane, you know, uh, drivers, pilots. Um, they 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 have like whatever lots of training, and they're trustworthy for this job. We need the same thing here. We need the people who are operators of these AI systems to understand the consequences, to understand AI mm -hmm. safety, to um, understand what can go wrong, to know what the protocols are that have been decided collectively to protect everyone. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the first thing. Um, it's not perfect, uh, but but it it goes a long way, and it's going to give us more time to uh, figure out how we can you know what we can do in case it fails. No regulation is going to be completely foolproof. At some point, somebody is not going to follow the rules the, the, for all kinds of reasons, and we can, you know, delay that. We can reduce the probability, but it's going to happen. So, I also think that we need Plan B. So that's the countermeasures in my U.S. Senate uh, proposal. So we need to start thinking of, well, what if it happens? Maybe in ten years from now, what kind of infrastructure? What kind of research do we need to do? in order to protect humanity, to protect the public, to protect democracy. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not claiming I have the answers, but we need to do, I think, a massive effort. I think you know, this is sort of like Manhattan Project-like kind of thing, in order to protect humanity against something that may happen never or may happen in 10 years or in 20 years. Um, we need the two things. So we need like plan A is regulation with, you know, the external uh, audits of independent uh, you know researchers and so on which we don't have right now obviously yeah uh, we we close. need also international coordination when we do that because we want to make sure all the countries follow some minimal standards and yeah. we need that because it's not enough say for the US to have their rules even though right now it's all like American companies because Computer viruses or you know biological viruses don't care about borders, as I wrote. Uh, Definitely not. It, it needs to be international. Of course, it has to start with the U.S. and probably the next thing it has to be U.S. and China agreeing on some standards. Um, yeah. But but at some point it has to be international and it has to be a treaty that's enforced quite strongly because there's so much at stake. So, for example, it shouldn't be something that's negotiated independently of other things like we've tr like the mis big mistake i think with climate is we've tried to negotiate climate specific treaties we have to negotiate like global treaties where for example commerce is part of it so if commerce is part of it it's like oh if you don't abide by the minimal standards of you know uh co2 emissions and ai safety then we don't do business with you right i mean that's like the uh, simple form of it sure sure yeah yeah this is a, a vision more for, and as you had said, imperfect, but I think all of these are reasonable ideas. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything you said that I thought was overtly unreasonable. I think there's some people who really do associate any monitoring of what's going on with compute to completely require iron-fisted authoritarianism, and I don't think that's necessarily no, it's true. It's not how it is now uh, but, in, in most sectors of society. So, 
Certain, certainly, you're, you're painting a vision of um, a distributed power, not not a hyper centralized a distrib- where we have international agreements and where those things are going on. I, I think that I think there's complete completely reasonable arguments, and all of this would sort of serve the the way that I think about it. I think it was like f- four or five years ago. I sort of uh, surmised that maybe the United Nations. You know, we have these uh, standard. Um, uh, sustainable development right. goals, right? Yeah, the SDGs, uh, the treatment of women, um, uh, fresh water, food, etc. Uh, is it somewhat inevitable that whether it's the UN or not, there will need to be an international body? There were two that I had sort of suspected. Maybe you would name them differently or, or see them differently. One is some sort of body that might help to decide on the trajectory of intelligence. Name of this show, uh, and it was you know it's five year old blog post, but. What are the directions we're willing to explore and not explore? And what are the directions we're definitely going to move towards? Maybe there's very safe AI for certain applications around helping physicians that absolutely we're going to further NLP in that way, but we don't want to further it in these ways. We know it's dangerous and we don't know about these ways. So we're not going there yet. So maybe a trajectory, an intelligence trajectory sort of sustainable uh, sustainable development goal of, of discerning that internationally. Secondly, some kind of steering and transparency committee. That is to say... Are we abiding by this? Mm-hmm. Is anybody breaking this? Can we monitor these things? Would you imagine it somewhat similarly, yeah. or would you see it very differently than that? Yes, and I would add a third uh, kind of, uh, which is coordinating research. So people have talked about a CERN. I think it, you know, CERN is is nice, but it because it's nonprofit, but it, it, we need something decentralized. Uh, not we. It doesn't need to be like in one facility, like like the. Uh, physics things. Collider, yeah. the big collider they yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, luckily we don't have to collide atoms to, to do this stuff. Um, so uh, thank thank goodness. Um, uh, so, okay, got it. So you're, just to be clear. That's I agree. I agree with your, your vision happen. here. Understood. Um, with that said, it does feel to me, and I'll just clarify a little bit of this before we wrap up, but I'm really interested in your take, and I'm sure I'm going to see them continue to evolve uh, over the discussions in the year ahead, and hopefully my perspectives will evolve as well. It, it seems as though you know you're for this continued distribution of power. Um, you're for inching towards progress, but definitely not racing towards ascension. But really thinking about where things are going before we we break too much farther on the right of that spectrum. Are you congenial to this idea that, or I don't know if you've read the precipice. It doesn't matter. But he has this notion of kind of this long pause, I might be misquoting him, but it's a similar, yeah. it's a similar idea of, Hey, let's sort of think internationally around where might we want to blast off to and what's safe and what's not before we, we really start plowing forward. Are you, are you congenial yeah, to this no, general I, I, idea? I think it's a reasonable option. Um, and f- yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in favor of something like this. Now, my only concern with this is, it's like the, the the pause letter that I signed in March. Yes. Is it actually going to work? Like, are we going to be able to convince, um, uh, let's say, the U.S. government to do something like this? I, I'm afraid that there's too much money at stake. Um, for this, it's too late already. Like, the the markets have understood that. There are like trillions to be made in the coming years. Trillions. Trillions and trillions. So uh, Stuart Russell in his book talks about quadrillions of net present value. And his calculation is actually pretty simple. And he's talking about raising the material like level of everyone on Earth. And if you take to that calculation, that's what you get. Anyways, whatever the exact numbers are, it's huge. So it's going to be hard to stop that train. But but we should we if we can slow it down to give us more time to think through how to deal with that. Uh, I'm all for it. Absolutely, I'll we'll clarify just a bit a bit more on that. Um, the uh, it seems unlikely to me, and maybe you have a different perspective here. That you know, back in the day, there was sort of the Sputnik moment that we had, right, where Russia launched something up into the the sky, and we didn't, and maybe we just want to jump in the space race, or or the Pearl Harbor, for example. Um, you know, these these threshold events, some of the, which are terribly traumatic, that eventually set humanity to do something. World War II had to happen before the United Nations, as you and I know it, um, came to e- exist initially. All those meetings in San Francisco 
however many years. A good ago. outcome of the Second World War. I, I would I would say so. I would say so. I think for all of its flaws, I think it's an incredibly admirable effort of the species. This idea of distributed power yeah. at that I, level, I think, is a, a shocking yeah. achievement yeah, I, of the species. I, for all I, its flaws, I encourage go ahead. everyone who listens to this to go back and read the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it's amazing. It's been signed by signed by USSR and China, and it talks about democracy. Now, it, it's not a it's not a uh, it, it's a uh, non binding kind of agreement, but it's it's beautiful. Like if only we could live by the standards written in that declaration today, it would be such a better world. I haven't read it word for word. I've read a lot about the history of the United Nations, which I'd also encourage people to read. But um, I'll have to dive back into the. The Declaration of Human Rights. Who knows exactly how well it's being uh, adhered to? You know what with the Uyghurs and all. But um, uh, an admirable document and a, and a good achievement for humanity took us took us a pretty painful road to get there. You know the League of Nations didn't work out, etc. Um, I suspect that if there is a a combative or competitive dynamic that is the big threshold moment next, it may not encourage a pause. In other words, let's say OpenAI is all of a sudden worth more than Google and Tesla and Facebook combined. I don't think that's going to make them slow down. It's probably going to make them want to speed up. Similarly, if China does something that affects the US, let's say they use uh, TikTok or a thousand other myriad ways to, in a very overt sense, um, put the thumb on the scale of the opinions of children or so something that we all consider to be terribly dastardly and horrible. I don't know if that's going to make us all get to a pause. I suspect those will encourage arms races. Here's what I think would encourage the opposite of an arms okay. race. And I, I hate to say this, and I'd love to know if you have a different opinion. I suspect we would need an event of AI um, acting unpredictably for whoever is supposedly controlling it as a human, where it spooks, whether it be a Chinese lab or a US lab, enough for all of us humans to look at each other, us, us hairless monkeys who have things in common and say, guys, 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 this is something different, right? What the Greeks do is they kill other Greeks until the Persian masts are on the horizon. That's what they do. They kill each, they kill other Greeks until the masts are on the horizon. Then, you know, Themistocles can lead them and all those wonderful things can happen. I wonder if we don't almost need an alien invasion, something yeah. that's separate from human interest. I wish it wasn't that way. Do you believe otherwise? Well, a, a Hiroshima for AI would probably change things uh, the way you're talking about in the sense of uniting uniting humanity uh, in this. Um, but yeah, I wish there is a way to avoid that. I don't know. We should try to be like reasonable and and compassionate for each other. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but at least we should try because the cost of a Hiroshima here and not to mention the risk that it, it actually, you know, there is no humanity after that. Uh, so she, we should do our best yep. without, you know, we waiting for something. I think like the worst thing would be let, let's just let it go and then something is going to blow up and then we'll, you know, come to our senses. I, I think the rational thing to do is to try to prevent it, even though it's a tough, you know, uh, call. Yeah, uh, I would completely agree. And we'll we'll end on this note of level-headedness, which is, in my opinion, outside of the scientific uh, uh, work, a big boon of the contribution of, of your voice in this conversation. Um, I want to speak to those parties that are on maybe opposite sides of the camp of where you are on that on that matrix and just lay out what your level-headed ideas would be for them. You've had a done a great job empathizing with, but still bringing up valid points to people that hold different perspectives. We'll wrap on this very, very quickly, but I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Let's just say there's somebody on the accelerationist camp. There's some people that are the clearly, purely self-destructive. Let's leave that out for now. Let's say that there's folks who say, look, um, you know, control on the aggregate feels like the collaboration stuff would easily lead to people controlling what's going on in computers. And eventually, you know, if, if there were enough people that didn't want this stuff to come to be, then we wouldn't have this blooming beyond human value. You know, we had just monkeys once and then we had people and there's whole ecosystems of longer lifespans and, and infinitely greater sentient experience on distant galaxies and even distant dimensions that we'll just never unlock if we don't bloom 
we should encourage openness and blooming, and that ought to be good. Your, your immediate argument to why you stand significantly more conservative to that, what would be the quick version for you? Compassion. There are people suffering right now. There are harms that are happening right now that are caused by AI. Um, there are like 8 billion beautiful human beings out there, and they exist now. Um, I think that there's a human propensity to care for each other that at least I would find difficult to ignore. And so, although I'm not against the idea of exploring something better than humans, uh, we have to do it in a way that is considerate to all the beauty that currently exists and all the pain that currently exists and that we have to take care of. Extremely level-headed. I have nothing to argue with there. Um, the other camp, and our final point here that we'll leave people on, is there might be also a camp on the drastically more conservative side than right. yourself who already think Yashua Ben, and some of them are probably just, you know, a little off the deep end on some kind of a religious kick about anybody working on AI is inherently terrible. But let's leave that crowd out. Again, let's take the completely irrational, overtly destructive folks out of the mm -hmm. crowd and just say that there are people who, maybe it's religion, maybe it's children and grandchildren like you you have, maybe it's something else. And they say, honestly, any tiny bit of inchworming beyond present hominidness is too much of a risk for our species. We should look for a billion year future of man as he is or as she is. Uh, we ought not alter that because we know what has happened to lesser species historically. Giving up that mantle, even by a millimeter, is far too much. And we ought not even be open to those futures that Mr. Bengio just said that maybe in the long term he would be open to. What might you say to that crowd? Well, I think we have to have an open mind. It's just like what philosophy teaches and science teaches that, first of all, we need to open our mind and our hearts to other living beings, intelligent or, you know, less intelligent that exist right now. And once you do that, first of all, you might want to be vegetarian. Second, uh, you, you might have some more respect for the possibility that other intelligent beings could arise. And um, we just need to be like doing, I, I think we, we do need to protect humanity. We do need to try to remain safe, but we also need to consider the possibilities that, that exist. And it's okay if it takes time. It's We need to take the time that it, we need for understanding and taking the right decisions. But humans are not the end all. Uh, we are part of a you know bigger um, story that, that is unfolding. And even currently there are, I think, lots of beauty in other species that, that we you know we don't know what it is to feel like a bat. Uh, for example, or a dolphin, uh, or or a dolphin. Yeah. and and so I think we need to have respect for that. I'm in all honesty, Joshua. Having never seen you posted or write about this, I'm I'm actually surprised uh, on your position there, your your openness to that future beyond sort of the the conservative stance. But I I do think that that's a really strong message to send to that crowd. And I I figured as the guy who has been the ambassador of opening minds uh, in the science world. Why not do that here? And I think it's a perfect note to end on. So, Yashua, I know that's all we have for time, but thank you so much for being able to join. It's It's been a pleasure being able to chat with you after these long eight years. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the discussion today. So that's all for episode one of The Trajectory. I couldn't have been happier having Yashua as our first guest in this series. Again, this entire series, we're going to have five episodes in total focused on destinations. Again, where do we want to land in those future combinations of man and machine? And you're going to see that um, intelligence trajectory political matrix that we brought up in this episode come through over time. For those of you who might just be engaged via audio, make sure to check out the show notes or just go to danfagella.com slash ITPM. That stands for intelligence trajectory political matrix. You can get a sense of what we were talking about in this episode with Yashua. 
Next up is Jan Tallinn, famed founder of Skype and probably the most prolific donor to AI safety causes over the last 10 years. Um, Jan is also deeply involved with the United Nations' new thrust around AI risk and AI safety. He unpacks his thoughts with us in the next episode, so I hope you'll stick around and catch us then. Thanks so much.